chapter B in the fourth chapter of Ephesians again. This will be our 49th, 49th message. We're going to be in verse 13 of Ephesians 4. Now it's important to know that in the salvation of God, requirements are on a higher level than a law of commandments. <clears throat> now a lot of people have not seen this, but it's important to see. Now God hasn't eliminated commandments. And God forbid that anyone should think he has. In fact, it's, it's his commandments that aren't grievous. To those who love him, they're, they're pain in the neck to everybody else, <laughs> which is a bad sign. No one is apt to be forever with the Lord who's offended by what he says. It's something to ponder. Now the commandments that the Lord Jesus gives are summed up in a little different way than the commandments that were given by the law. John put it this way, he summed up in one commandment, this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave his commandment. <laughs> it's quite a bit different than anything before, before Christ. So I say it's higher and deeper at the same time. Now the objectives of the commandments in Christ are quite different than the objectives of the commandments under the law. Under the law, the commandments were to subdue sinful expression. That was their primary purpose. Stop people from doing this, stop them from doing that. And the penalty for not doing it was you died. Now I tell you that was a straightforward, but it didn't change anybody. Did it? Now the purposes were different than that. The purpose of God's commandment isn't just to make sure you don't do anything wrong. Uh, to be sure you're not free to do anything wrong, we understand. <laughs> understand. But here's how the scripture puts it. Now the end or purpose of the commandment is the first Timothy one. Five is charity out of a pure heart and love unfeigned and a pure conscience. First Timothy one five. That's what the that's what God aims by His commandments in Christ. Aims for your conscience to be pure. He aims for you to love out of a pure heart without ignoble motives. And they have a good conscience before him. Amen. That's the that's, that's so far as while you're here. Why, this is while you're here results. Many professed believers have never seen this perspective. A lot of people have been going to church for years, never seen this. They, they don't have a good conscience, but they don't think it's very serious. Even though God's aim is that when you come before him, when you're acutely aware of God, when you're aware of his presence, it doesn't condemn you. Amen. Amen. Some people run away from God because of their conscience. They don't want to go to what they call church. They don't want to hear the Bible because it condemns them. See, their conscience is bad. God, God that's, got to be, that's got to be solved before you die. Amen. Before you leave this world, that's got to be resolved. You've got to, for one of another term, feel comfortable in the presence of God. You've got to come to the point where you prefer to be before God yeah. rather than anyone else. Of course, that may change what you do on Sunday <laughs> and other times, but that's the way it is. Some people, they, they'll ask questions. Because they don't understand this, they'll ask questions. What Does the Bible say I can't do this? That's the kind of questions they ask. Is there anything in the Bible against this? Those are bad questions. 
I was about to say the stupid questions, but that's a, that's a little strong. Did you ever think that the most important thing is to do something right? Persons would say, what can I do to be right? Instead of, what, what should I avoid? <laughs> what should I do? To, what must I do? You notice whatever, when anyone was convicted by the hearing of the word in Scripture, they say, what must we do? They never did say, what can't I do? They didn't say that. But people say this all the time. I'm talking about religious people say this all the time. For the church not to produce these kind of people that say, what must I do? Or the, for the church to not produce people that have a good conscience toward God. Or not to produce people that have charity out of a good heart. Or not to produce people who have love unfeigned. If they're not producing this kind of people, then the people aren't being taught the truth. I don't care what was said. I don't care how many Bible verses are quoted. The truth hasn't been taught because God produces these kind of people. When the, tr when the truth of the gospel is preached, this is the kind of people it produces. Yeah, now, we're right. this is right along the line of our text here, but God has given us, put some gifts in the church, some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. They're all for the church. What the text says, even evangelists, even evangelists, they're primarily for the church. Even the evangelists, Ephesians 4, 12 is what it says. Verse, verse 12 on tells you that they're for the edifying of the church. That's what it says. Amen. Men didn't contradict this. Mm -hmm. But that's their responsibility. It's our responsibility to believe what what is said. Now these apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, they're primary, not the solid, no, I didn't say solitary, I say primary. Their primary work is build up the church. Amen. Now somebody's not obeying this. We got a dead church on our hand in America. It is worse in Europe and the rest of the world's in the same shape. It's the product of its preaching. This dead church is the result of what it's heard Amen. and what's been emphasized and what's been preached and all of these programs that have been instituted. It's produced this kind of thing. What is plainly taught here for the edifying of the church, building it up, strengthening it, for the edifying of the church, for the work of the ministry, so that Everyone is a minister. They're doing something that helps somebody else in the body. Amen. And now it's going to elaborate on that. Till we all come to the unity of the faith. Some ver till we all come. Till we all. Who's we? Well, this is the body. It's the body of Christ. Till we all come. To the unity of the faith. Now, as, to, as of today, there are roughly 322,000 Christian denominations. Majority of them condemning whoever's not a part of them. There are 22,000 fundamental denominations, each one of which is split into all kind of fractions. Now, here the scripture tells us the purpose of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers is to do things that lead to this unity. Now there's no such thing as a legitimate apostle, a legitimate prophet, a legitimate evangelist, and a legitimate pastor and teacher that doesn't, his ministry is not to this end. There's no such thing as this. So you've got people that wear these names but don't have these results, they're imposters, they're, they're not real people. Till we all come, I'll look at that phrase, till we all come. Some versions say till we all meet together. That's the Geneva Bible. Till we're all together. With, while we're with each other. Till when we're, so from this, these versions are so what they're saying. It's, until when we come together, we're in, we're in this state of unity when we're together. 
I mean, when you're not together, you don't know whether you're united or not. Let's be straightforward to this. A lot of people talk about unity, but they're not talking about being together. But unity postulates being together. Amen. Who ever heard of a dissembled body? Yeah. If I showed you out here in the backyard a pile of car parts and said, that's my car, you'd say, I'm some kind of nut. This isn't a car. <laughs> but there's all kinds of people pointing to a, this is a fractured, dismembered body of people, and they say it's a church. I'm telling you, it's not a church. We meet together. So we have these two different ideas. This is, is this when we meet together? Or is this just like a philosophical matter that we're all, no matter where you are, you're agreed? Is that what it means? Well, I'm inclined toward the, the former view that it does emphasize when we come together. The rest of the text kind of underscores that. The unity that faith has to do when we come together. It's not too hard to be united with someone you're not with. At least say you're, you're we're one with them, you know, <laughs> but you're, you're not with them. You really don't hear some of their ideas or that sort of thing. If this is true, this, that this when we come means it, when we're together, if this is true, then this means we've got to be meeting for the same purpose. This means we're focused on the same person when we meet. We're focused on the same person. And we have the same ultimate objective. The stress isn't on the assembly itself. It's on the condition of the assembly. Amen. All right, now if you take an take a average church that you know about, Big, little, doesn't make any difference. They're pretty much, pretty much the same. It's just you guys have a little country church. You got 15 people, or you got you got what's called a mega church. You got several thousand. Have you ever, in your life, been in a church assembly where you knew the state of the assembly itself? Now you may have. I'm not saying you haven't. <laughs> I think I have been, but it's uh, I had to like do some thinking. This is what he's talking about here. If the church, when it comes together, is not united, it's not united, period. And the aim of the ministries is that when they come together, they've been living so close to God, they all kind of have the same ideas when they come together. I'm not talking about same subjects and this sort of thing. I mean, when something's said, everyone says, amen, you know, amen. I can see that. You know, in a, in a Bible college, I was counseled by the president not to say amen. Oh, yeah. And I said to him, I said, well, brother so-and-so, I'll say it louder now. I'm, no, I'm not going to stop saying amen at all. Of course, he told me the reason why is that some of the professors, when they preached, I didn't amen them. I said, well, yes, because they didn't have anything decent to say. Of course I didn't name them. Brother Gibbon was talking about that when we all come together, we're yeah. in the same mind, not necessarily because we've been thinking about this same, the same particular, but you know, having one God promotes That's right. this, uh, That's this right. oneness That's in spirit. Right. When you live truth. with Christ, he's not going to produce one focus for you and one focus for me and one objective for you and one objective for me. Jesus has one agenda. That's all he's got. The agenda God gave him, that's his. Get the children home to glory. That's his objective. Hebrews 2.10 Bring the children. I mean, if you end up in hell, like it doesn't make a lot of difference what else you did. Yes? Yeah, there's, a, there's a basic flaw with that kind of thinking. Jesus is not brought into our agenda. Yeah, yeah. We have been brought into him. Yeah. So whenever you see that, it it just follows logically that we would have oneness because all of us are put in him. And he he's never changed his Amen. agenda. Amen. He's not going to be different. Mm -hmm. You Amen. see why the emphasis is on not being selfish, self-centered, you can see why. Jesus de-self-centers you. Yeah. 
So yourself isn't the main main thing. Christ, then that's the uniting factor. As soon as you start putting the emphasis on yourself, you're, you begin to be divided from the other saints of God. So the secret of unity is is, is a putting to death the old nature. It's dying. You got to die to yourself. And this is where the the gifts enable this to happen to, to take place. And the apostles they chiefly minister to us through their doctrine, which is written down. We all. We only have the writings of two apostles. Matthew would be the third. But you don't need any more because they had one message. So whatever one of them said, the I was in total agreement with what the rest said. So there wasn't a need to have everybody say what, write an epistle. <laughs> Whoever wrote one represented all of them, you see. So they were united. But wherever apostles and prophets have people speak with discernment, they can take, they recognize the truth, they can put it together. They can put it together so that they, they edify, exhort, and comfort the saints of God. That's a prophet. And evangelists are powerful proclaimers. They can affirm the gospel and, and associate it with any circumstance. They can bring, this is where... This is where Christ comes in. This is where Christ is needed. That's what the gospel is. It's about Christ. So some people can associate Jesus with, with something, and when they do it, it clears it up. And pastors and teachers are people who care for the flock and feed the flock. Their ministry is what guarantees this will happen. If that ministry is subdued, this won't happen. You can have unity meetings from now to the end of the world, and it won't work unless these ministries are active. <laughs> and the ministry of the apostles is still active. Well, it's still active, but that's their, 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 it's through their Amen. word. Just yeah, like yeah. Jesus, he left, but his word yeah. stayed. Mm -hmm. The apostles left with their word yes. stayed in writing. Some would not understand that. Some would yeah. think that we need apostles. Well, I know. Human being apostles, they're with us. For but I've heard some. Act. I've heard some of these apostles that are, they like to be called apostles, yeah. and and I knew more than they knew, so they couldn't have been an apostle. That's kind of the test. If they don't know as much as you know, they can't be an apostle. <laughs> not, not at all, because an apostle was taught directly. The Apostles' Doctrine doesn't consist of what they said about marriage. You understand this, don't you? The Apostles' Doctrine doesn't consist of what they said about your neighbor. That's not the Apostles' Doctrine. The Apostles' Doctrine is what they opened up concerning Christ. Now you'll notice Luke was not an Apostle. He didn't tell you one thing about redemption that was new. James is not an Apostle. He didn't tell you one thing about redemption that is that was new that hadn't been said by the apostles he just built on what the apostles said Jude was not an apostle he didn't say one thing that was like a new insight if you want insight into what the foundational matters are you got to get it from an apostle Amen. that's how Jesus arranged it he said they'll believe on me through their word and their word is not popular in the church. When we moved to Missouri, the most popular preaching book was Proverbs. Yeah. It's the truth. I'm telling you the truth. And there's still people to this day that say the secret to a godly life is read six Psalms and six Proverbs every morning. Why didn't they say six words of Jesus? <laughs> they don't know what they're talking about. That's why. We're not saying these other things aren't helpful, but we're saying you've, your perspective has to be shaped by apostolic doctrine. How you see things, that's what has to shape it. If you let Solomon shape your thinking, you'll, you'll be a nutcase. Because Solomon's, could you imagine Paul saying, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Could you imagine Paul saying that? Why didn't he say it? Because he saw more than Solomon saw. God, God gave Solomon the most wisdom you could get in this world. And in it, he showed you that that's not the best wisdom. 
Because the older Solomon got, the dumber he got. And God got it angry with him because he appeared to him two times and yet he went off the deep end with idolatry. Yeah. Why? It is to teach people that the answer isn't the college education. Well, that, I didn't mean to be quite that frank, but that's, some people think it is the answer. Yeah. Yeah. But it isn't. It's the Apostles' Doctrine. Till we, who's the we? Till we, till we all come to the unity of the faith. Well, that applies to believers that are still in the world. There's any problem with unity in the faith of the ones that left. I mean, there's no problem. <laughs> they well, the spirits are just made made perfect. They have no trouble with unity. They're joined together with holy angels and so forth. They're they're in a favored climb, so to speak. They, it's the people that are in the world. That's that's the people that have trouble with it. So the we, that's all the saints that are in the world and have some kind of proximity to each other. It also presumes that. It's easy to say, we're, with, we're united with everybody in the world. Praise God that's a Christian. Well, you might be surprised if you meet some of these people. You might wonder whether you really are or not. So we all, that's, we, that's the saints, all, all of us, that means no person in Christ that is alive in the world is excluded. But this like has to be discovered, if you know what I mean. And till we all come, oh, the, gee, the word itself speaks of progress. We're moving toward, mm -hmm. towards something. It's the appointed, appointed place or status, till we all come. See, the saints of God are on the move to, Amen. to a pivotal point. It's like it's like a triangle. We're starting out down here on earth at a little seven. We we're growing and we're growing closer together as we grow closer to God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's how it works. It is marvelous when you actually know this. You don't reach this state automatically. It's not this once the growth process you, it starts, it just takes place and you just this is just what happens. That's not the way it works. He gave gifts, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to ensure this progress takes place. So if you neglect or you're not exposed to apostles, prophets, events, prayers, and teachers, this progress won't be made because that's the means by which it's made. See, So a scripturally illiterate church is going nowhere up. It's descending. It's not ascending. See? So these do-gooders and people that preach about family problems and all this, see, they're damaging the people. They're hitting the people in the head with a hammer, dulling their conscience and dulling their minds and making them think this world is bigger than it really is. I'm thinking about it's uh, the work of the ministry among the saints. This is just about as much work involved in as, as that agricultural example That's we've right. been given. There's That's a lot right. of work That's involved right. in producing a crop. That's right. And there's a lot of work until we all come. Till we all come, that's yeah. right. Amen. It's an ongoing thing. Yes, you can't take a pill like and this so all, all happens. The teaching of Christ's bodies with the prospect of them coming together in unity, real unity. Unity the unity of the faith. That's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Some of my other versions, let me give you what some other versions read. The basic Bible English says the harmony of the faith. The Holman Bible says the unity implied by trusting. The Geneva Bible says they meet together in the unity of the faith. Or we're united in our faith. God's Word Bible. We are all together. We must be united in our faith. Arrive at oneness of the faith, Weymouth says, and some others. Now, Paul's already affirmed there's one faith, right? He's already affirmed this in the fourth beginning of this chapter. There's one faith. There's not two faiths, there's one faith. Some people say, well, of what faith are you? You know, if you say, well, I'm, a, I'm part of the faith. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> a Christian evangelist one time was traveling on a train he was reading his Bible, and a 
man said to him, he says, oh, I see that you are a Christian. Yes, he says, yes, I am. He says, uh, so you're a member of the church? Yes, I'm a member of the church. Yes, so what, what branch? He says, sir, sir. He said, I am a branch. <laughs> Amen. Unity of the faith. See, there's no, and faith roots basically in Christ. Contrary to the teaching that says faith is a body of doctrine, I don't know where that comes from. I've tried to find out the origin of that saying that faith is a body of doctrine because the Greek word pistis at no place means a body of doctrine. But there are people who teach that means a body of doctrine. What you, what you believe. No. What you believe is not the issue here. It's whom you believe. Amen. That's the issue. <laughs> whom you believe. Unity of the faith. It's faith in Christ. Because faith is substance and it's evidence. Faith is what puts a handle on truth so you, you get a hold of it. Faith is like eyeglasses are to the eyes. And he was going to hear. It's like a hearing aid. He was going to hear. Faith, faith puts you in touch with reality. And there's only one body of ultimate reality. So a unity of the faith is everyone seeing the same thing. Now you may be at this angle and that angle. Doesn't mean you all know you all know the same thing. It's not what it means. It means you all see the same thing. And when you learn something new, it's not hard. Yeah, amen. Yeah. Have you grown to that point yet where learning is not hard? Amen. See, until there, there comes a point in time in your progress in Christ when it's not difficult to see new things. At the beginning, sometimes it's hard, hard. Well, you've been taught you're headed down this way and you're used, you're used to a country road and all of a sudden you're on a blazing highway, you know, and you can't get used to it. But it, at pretty soon you do. It's not difficult to learn when you hit this point. That's, what is that? That's a unity of the faith. So you may not know what brother so-and-so knows. When brother so-and-so speaks it, you say, oh, I, I see that. I, I'm united. I'm right with him on that. I can see. I never saw it before, but I do now. That's, you, that's unity of the faith, see? Unity of the faith. This faith is what actually brings us together. That's the thing that unites us. It's not that we all have the same creed or have the same name or follow the same synod or whatever. That isn't what makes us one. That's why we don't ask people what church, what church you a member of. We know we can we have around you for a while. We know. <laughs> oh yeah, I I could t I could tell you what denomination a person a belongs to after I'm around him for a while. So yeah, he's. But when a person focuses on Christ, you don't think about what sect, what denomination, what group. You don't think this way. You just think, thank God I found, found another family member. That's the unity of the faith, see? And the ministry of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers is intended to produce this. Amen. Unity of the faith. So if you listen to the apostles long enough, you'll become sensitive to other people that are in Christ. What they teach causes this sensitivity. You, you hear a prophet speak and pretty soon your spirit is enlarged and you're able to recognize people that are in Christ that maybe you didn't expect were. And, you're, and you, of course, will become suspicious of some people you thought were. One faith. Faith is the thing that is realized when you enter the kingdom and it stays with you all the way through your earthly tenure. Faith, you live by faith. That's what, that's what causes you to advance and what brings you together with other people. You remember, of course, we're justified by faith and we have peace with God by faith. Faith enables us to stand. We stand by faith. We're kept by the power of God through faith. It's so faith, faith, faith all along is the key ingredient. It's, it's like the, the main ingredient on whatever God's doing. Faith is the main thing. That's why chapter 11 of Hebrews is about faith. Not about love. It's not about hope. It's about faith. It's not about works. It's about faith. 
That's what made these people, and all these people were united. If Abraham met Paul, he'd say, praise God, Brother Paul. You know, they, they would have no trouble. Amen. When they met in the glory, they didn't say, you know, I had a little trouble with the record about you, Lot. I had a little trouble. God said you were righteous, and I didn't think you were. But when you get the glory, see, that'll all be corrected. Amen. Lot will tell you, well, look, brother, if I wasn't righteous, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> because God said he was righteous. So uh, we can't tolerate someone speaking about our brethren, saying they're not. They were carnal. Oh, we don't, we don't, we don't allow that. When God's spoken about a person, I uh, know that's unity of the faith. See, unity of the faith. This faith constrains a person to live acceptably to God. Some people they got the they got to have a hook in their nose or a rope tied around them to keep them in line. Like you do with little children, you know, you gotta make you gotta make them do what's right. They don't say, "Mommy, today I'm only gonna do what's right." <laughs> yeah, before the day is over, you gotta take them to the side, do a little further education on the subject. <laughs> but faith moves you out of that kind of a men mentality. So you're saying, "What do you want me to do, Lord? What what will you have me to do?" So you think this way. Here am I, send me. That's how you respond, you respond that way. It's the unity of the faith. So where, where faith is either non-existent or minimal, there'll be a tendency to separate from the body of Christ and kind of go your own way. Well, this will happen. Well, yeah, I'm telling you the truth. This will happen. If a person's faith begins to diminish, pretty soon they, they don't see a need to be around the family. The whole family in heaven and earth. They don't see a particular need for the ministry of the gifts that God has put. But when they do have faith, that changes the whole picture. Now, till we all come means this is an objective. This has got to be met. We're going nowhere till this is met. Till we all come into the unity of the faith. Till this happens, we're just, we're just at the initial stages at the very best. That's, that's all. But see, that it doesn't end there. Till we all come to the unity of the faith, and as if that wasn't difficult enough, and to the unity of the knowledge of the Son of God. We've uh, all got to see Jesus alike. <laughs> well, that isn't the case. Some people say, well, Jesus loves everybody. Others say, oh, Jesus doesn't love everybody. And Jesus wants to be. Jesus wants to hang out with sinners. Someone else says, "No, Jesus wants to hang out with his disciples." And see, there's not there's not the same view about Jesus at all. But in the church, I'm talking about, and the, the scriptures recognize this condition can exist. So I put gifts to the church to ensure this this does not happen. Now it says the unity of the faith and I want to comment on the word and. Because uh, it's a major step forward when you're, you have a spiritually rational view of and. And is like a knot that ties two things together. Sometimes more than two. And. Let me give you some of these. Grace and truth. <laughs> they got to go together. <laughs> you can't have truth without grace or grace without truth. Either get this and in there. And there's Love and peace. And we read about love and patience of hope. You see these two, two things tied together. Love and faith. Righteousness, peace and joy. Consolation and salvation. Everlasting consolation and good hope. Joy and consolation. Faith and power. Work of faith and labor of love. Faith and a good conscience, faith and patience, faith and hope. See, it's, <laughs> it's a unity of, it, you've got to see that faith, unity of the faith is necessarily combined with unity of the knowledge of the Son of God. These, these are not like two separate things and you can have one or the other or one you can have a lot and a minimal amount of the other. Though These go together, unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. It's what we call a coordinating conjunction. It fits together two necessary things, not two optional things. It's not, 
not two optional things. Now this kind of arrangement helps us to examine ourselves a little better. You may look for yourself, but look at yourself and say, well, I'm looking to see if I have any love. Well, it's, it, it, love doesn't just stand by itself. You want to see whether you've got some of these ands, whether they're in there. <clears throat> now let's look at this knowledge, the knowledge, faith, unity of the faith and of the knowledge. This is a facet of unity. Unity is like a prism, and knowledge is one of the facets. If if you just if you could envision a jewel that had five facets, and as I understand it, the number of facets has a lot to do with the value of the jewel. Well, you would not have the option of like filing off one of those facets and blending them together. You'd lose a whole lot of the all a whole lot of the stone if you did. Or if it had just four facets, and if you had decided like to reduce it to three, you'd lose a it's a considerable percentage of the stone, yeah. if you did. So these facets are, are necessary. A facet of unity is knowledge. You can't do away with it, yet the modern church has managed to kind of obscure this so that you don't really have to know very much to be a member in good standing. You can really be pretty ignorant about the things of God and everything's okay, you still show, and that's not what this text says. It always says, that we, we admit that, that we start out that way, we admit that, but we're aiming at dissolving this lack of knowledge, unity the knowledge of the Son of God. You know, you could hardly imagine even a small number of believers that are united in their knowledge of the Son of God. Very rare. I've experienced this some. I think we experienced it to a degree here. It's very rare. But see, God doesn't intend for it to be rare. He set gifts in the church so it would be common. So this would be the normal, normal status. Knowledge. Now the word knowledge in all of its various forms, that would be like knowledge, knowing, knows, it's mentioned 1,097 times in Scripture. Knowledge. So that's, that makes it pretty important. There's a knowledge of good and evil. That was right, right away in the Garden of Eden. The knowledge of good and evil. There's a knowledge of the Lord, Second Chronicles 30. There's the knowledge of God's ways, Job 21. There's a knowledge of God, Proverbs 2, the knowledge of salvation. Luke 177, the knowledge of sin, Romans 3.20, the knowledge of the glory of God, 2 Corinthians 4.6, the knowledge of his will, Colossians 1.9, the knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2.4. See, that's just a few areas of knowledge. What is meant by the word knowledge? We say knowledge. What, what, what do you mean when we say that? Well, this is the lexical meaning of the word as it's used in the in the Bible. You'll be surprised what it means. A recognition, full discernment, acknowledgement. That's Strong's. It's precise and correct knowledge. That's Thayer's Greek lexicon. Freiburg's lexicon says true knowledge. And with a degree of thoroughness or competence, Lunida lexicon. In the English language, what, is, what does knowledge mean in the English language? It means the fact or condition of knowing something with familiarity gained through experience or association, acquaintance with or understanding of a science, art, or technique, the fact or condition of being aware of something. Hmm. So the knowledge of the Son of God has to do with being able to recognize. That's the Lord. Yeah. Huh? It has to do with being familiar with him. Oh, this is not like the Lord. This just is like the Lord. It has to do with acquaintance with the Lord. Someone says, what do you think Jesus thinks about this? You can say, well, I don't know. Let's pray about this. Well, that's, that's fine. But you want to get to the point where you can make a definitive statement. <laughs> about, particularly when Jesus has spoken or done something about it. 
Someone said, what does God think about a world that's steeped in iniquity? Well, we can tell you about this because there was a, once there was a time in the world when violence covered the face of the earth yeah, like it is now. Yeah. And he just wiped it clean except for eight people. <clears throat> But he promised not to do it again because it because it didn't change that didn't change anybody, because the hearts of the the imagination of man's heart was evil continually before the flood, and God reaffirmed it in Genesis eight. It was that way after the flood too. So God didn't doesn't do a judgment like that. He just did it once. But that lets you know what God thinks about it. So knowledge, in this sense, is apparent. It's not like school knowledge, like learning in school or learning from books. This knowledge involves these, these things. Precision, correctness, truth, thorough acquaintance, competence to use it, being familiar with it, being associated with it, understanding and awareness. See, these are all involved in knowledge. Now, in the world, if you're going to be a doctor or an engineer or something like this, there's a certain there are certain things you have to know. Not like book know. You have to know how to do it. Now, if I was scheduled for heart surgery and I come in and the doctor had a book opened up by the surgical table and said, "Look, Mr. Blake, I." I, uh, I, I took this course, and I, but I forgot most of what I do. But I got the manual right here. It, it, it gives me the procedure, the walk-through procedure. I'd say, you know, is there another doctor in the house? So we, <laughs> well, listen, there's all kind of people that are entrusting their souls right. to people that don't know how to use the truth. Amen. It isn't do you know it, it's can you use it, because... You, what you know you can use. It's a difference between a little two-year-old child saying, I know what a hammer it is, is. look at here. And the parents say, well, just go to whatever you want to do with that hammer. You, you know it's a hammer. Yeah. Well, you'd have to have a major rebuilding program. You know that that doesn't happen. It's, how you, it's if you know how to use it. That tells you whether you know it or not. Like you might know the rules of mathematics, but if you don't know how to use them, you really don't, you really don't know them. <laughs> no, don't know them. Knowing. Now what a person knows must strictly conform to the truth that God's made known. And, and unity of the knowledge of the Son of God is people see Jesus the same way. They see him as God has revealed him. The record God has given of his Son. John calls it in 1 John 5, 10 and 11. Now any other, any other kind of unity will not be productive. It'll be like the unity of the people at Shinar. They were perfectly united. There was no divisions among them. But they were united for the wrong reason. <laughs> they tried to make a name for themselves, see? And God disrupted the unity. So the unity we're talking about is not a unity to make us successful. It's the unity that fulfills what God intends. Unity of the Son of God. This is what the ministry of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, this is what it does. It clarifies Christ, who He is, what He's done, what He's doing now, what He's going to do. It makes it clear to you. And once you see it and you accept it, it alters how you live. It alters how you see other people. It alters how you evaluate. See? Till we all come to unity of the knowledge of the Son of God. This kind of knowledge was the lifelong quest of Paul. It's not something you say, well, I got it now. I now got the knowledge of the Son of God. Praise God, I got it now. What's next, Father? No, it's not like that. Here's what, here's what Paul said. Some years after he was converted, he abandoned all competing interests, which were religious. He wasn't a drunk. <laughs> Paul wasn't immoral. He didn't have a colored past spotted with iniquity. 
He was a godly person, a religious person. In fact, he lived in good conscience all his life. Since he was a boy, he's brought up by the leading college professor, Gamaliel. See, he was he come from a religious, devout, religious background. And he's what he said about it. He, he threw it all overboard. That I might know him. There it is. Knowledge of the Son of God. That I might know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, be made conformable unto his death. The he knew that if I don't abandon my priorities, I will not get God's priorities. And which priorities are best? I mean, if you've if you know if you've experienced any fellowship with Christ, you know it was well worth whatever you left. Amen. We're not crying over what we were, Amen. unless it was we're sorry that we were such stooped to such depths. Knowing the Son of God, as I said, is able to recognize Him. So you go someplace and you you hear a good word from the Lord and it's administered to you. Say, well, boy, that. That was from God. Um, I just wish I belonged there, but I'm, I'm going to the first church of the Frigidaire over across town here, and I'm not, I can't go there. Well, you didn't recognize Christ. That's assuming that Christ is recognizable, understand. I'm not speaking of ourselves. I mean, if you recognize Christ is someplace, then wherever you were before that, you say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to align myself with Christ right here. I recognize him. And you recognize his salvation. You recognize his truth. And you stick with it. It was after, after and only after Jesus' disciples were convinced he raised from the dead was that resurrected life profitable to them. Until that time, it wasn't. As you know that Cleopas and his companion had been with Jesus all through his earthly ministry. As a person is acquainted with another person in the flesh, they, they knew Jesus. But they didn't recognize him on the road. Why didn't they? They didn't know him in the sense we're talking about here. They just knew him according to the flesh. The other disciples did too. They just knew him according to the flesh. It took a revelation from God to show Peter he was the son of God. Nobody was calling him son of God. Nobody ever did call him there but Peter that one time. And the demons, of course, they knew he was the son of God. I know who you are, the demons. I know who you are. But the people didn't until he was enthroned. Then once he was enthroned and he sent forth the spirit, the spirit opened this thing up to the people. And when Peter preached Christ on Pentecost, well, I'll tell you, it was from a fresh perspective. He had made this same Christ, this same person, both Lord and Christ. Yeah, he knew it, recognized him. And some professed Christians, they're like Cleopas and his companion. When Jesus is around, they don't know it. A unity that is not facilitated by the apostle, prophets, evangelists, and pastor teachers, that kind of thing situation has to be rectified. It's not a real unity, even though it may satisfy men. They've got to know who the Son of God is because everything hinges on the Son of God. Everything hinges on this. God will receive nothing from you except it's through the Son. He'll give you nothing except through the Son. This is the way it is, see? So our unity, the knowledge of the Son of God, it's not talking about every, every detail. It's talking about being able to recognize Christ. It'll stop you from doing certain things. Oh, I know the Lord. I know that I know the Lord wouldn't approve of this. But it'll stop you from doing certain things. And it'll compel you to do other things. Oh, this is the Lord. I've, I've got to do this. See? That's, that's the knowledge of the Son of God. When we come together, if this isn't the mindset of the people, then we've got to structure things to lead in that direction. It's possible that someone comes into the fellowship, into the gathering, and they're distracted by this or that. We don't condemn the people for that. We've all been in that condition at some time or another, where there have been distracting influences, and through our own weakness, we just were 
But the assembly has to be a place where things can be gathered. So the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, he's begin to minister. Pretty soon Christ is the focus word. Pretty soon another spirit. Spirits to get elevated. You feel, feel renewed in your spirit again. You're able to address some of the things that that's the unity of the knowledge of the Son of God. Critical for our work in the world to come too. Yes, yeah, right. Jesus said, "He that overcomes will sit with me in my throne, <laughs> even as I also overcame and am set down yes. with my Father Amen. in His throne." If you've ever been on a work site, I know I've talked to Levi about this. The Levi likes to likes to pick particular people to be with him when he goes on any kind of a work site, because. The knowledge he has of these people is critical yeah. when they're going to be working together in different aspects of a project so he doesn't have to explain everything. There's a certain measure of predictability. Mm -hmm. You know how they're going to work. You know yeah. how their work's going to butt up with what you do, and there yeah. doesn't have to be a lot of an explanation. But if you bring somebody brand new on the project that's unfamiliar and unacquainted, there's a lot of explanation, and it stops the work and can actually create problems. Amen. Mm -hmm. And so this is critical for us to to know now how to work with Christ mm -hmm. so that in the world to come there will be this perfect harmony we'll just yeah. we just join right in with what with what Christ is doing without asking all these questions this is Amen. why Paul couldn't take John Mark when he hopped off the ship went back home to mama this is why later John Mark turned around Paul but you'll notice you never read one more word about Barnabas after that event, except in Galatians, where a Barnabas was carried away with a dissimulation caused by Peter. He's sitting with the Jews. So you ask yourself the question, which one was in the heart of God's will? Well, it ought to be plain enough. And Paul was rec recognized he didn't like cast his view of John Mark in stone. He held it in abeyance, see? I don't question he prayed for him a lot, but when he saw John Mark turn around it, he said, bring him with you. He said, bring him with you. He'll do me. He's good for me. Do we all come to the unity of the faith? Well, you see, that's not the end yet. Notice the progression through this whole text, the progression. For the perfection of the saints in order to the work of the ministry, in order to the edifying of the body of Christ, in order to the coming into the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God in order to the realization of a perfect man. Now, no ministry that falls short of these objectives is valid. I want to be dogmatic about this. If it falls short of this progression, it's not a valid ministry. Now let's look at this phrase, Unto a perfect man. Another version read a mature man, which is what it means. Mature, mature manhood, full grown man, full growth, complete man, and so forth. Now there are two possible meanings of this expression. First is that each person will mature. The second is that the body as a whole may mature. Now the difference is between a mature Christian and a mature church. Now I understand you can't have a mature church made up of immature individuals. I mean, I understand that. Well, see, he's talk, he is talking about the, the we. He's talking about the we, the church. Go up into a perfect man. Now this makes perfect sense to me. Does it make sense that God would have a salvation that's tailored for one person? Now, he says them one by one. Yes, I understand that. But the salvation is not tailored for one person. Otherwise, one person would get it all. There'd be no need for gifts. You just dump it all out on everybody individually. See, there'd be no need for this person can do this, that person can do that. There'd be no need for that kind of thing if everybody got everything. See, but they don't. They do not. That's, that's the truth. Now, the prophet Isaiah told that... <coughs> When it comes to the investment God made in salvation, converting the Jews wasn't worth the investment of just of itself. Here's what he said, Isaiah 49, 6. 
It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. That's, that's, too, that's too little of a work to justify this thing I'm embarking on. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. All right, now if that's true, and it is, then salvation can be applied to the individual, but in its fullness it's not just for the individual. It's for the body. There's some people in Christ that have received things that you have not received. Now that doesn't include forgiveness. Everybody receives that. Doesn't receive access to God. Everybody gets that. See, Doesn't receive a right to enter. Everyone receives that. Doesn't include being accepted. Everybody receives that. Everybody's justified. Everybody's sanctified. Everybody's washed. See, there's, there's certain things that everybody partakes of, but there are some things that are distributed to each of the members. All right, now in this, this one to the perfect man, I'd say we, plural, be made a perfect man, singular. <laughs> He didn't say that we might be all be made perfect men. That, see, that would be the normal way you'd think you'd say it. But that we might become a perfect man. So if the perfect man is the, is the church, is a perfect man. Now, it's the same thing that he spoke of when he spoke of Jew and Gentile. In the second chapter, verse 15, Every day abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make of himself of, of twain, that's two, Jew and Gentile, one new man. See, so it's a new, <laughs> it's a new identity comprised of people that were formerly two peoples. Now, not two peoples, they're one people. So the unity, the perfect man he's talking about here is God targets the congregation being mature. Now you'll not hear you'll not hear this very often. In fact, I don't hear it. I don't hear it at all. But I'm I'm giving some leeway that I haven't heard everybody. God's salvation is designed to produce a mature church, a mature congregation. Now, most congregations I have noticed, the larger they are, the more this is prominent. Most of the people are babies. That's just the way it is. And even down to small congregations, you'll find that quite often the case, that most of the people are immature. But So the congregation itself is not what you call mature. The church at Jerusalem seemed to be fairly mature. The church at Antioch of Syria, they were, they were pretty mature. They had a lot of prophets in it and things like this. The church itself was mature. How is the Lord going to use a church that's immature? A person has to th think these things out. How is God going to dwell productively among a people and the people themselves as a group aren't mature? They're not perfected. They're not grown up. We do understand, as I've said, that a mature body postulates mature members. I mean, that has to be understood. But a mature body is not only comprised of mature members, it's comprised of mature members that are working together. See, that's, that's the difference. It's just not that everybody's mature, but we don't have much to do with each other, you know. No, it's, it, we're mature individually so we can work together collectively. Yes? The unity is, is so profound. Complete. He can refer to it in the singular That's as right. a man That's instead right. of men. That's right. Man. Now, doesn't it change your view when you, when you think of the church itself being mature? It changes how you look at things. Now, <coughs> when Jesus assessed the churches of Asia, he assessed them. He, he gave a report card on them. He assessed them as a whole. Did you notice that? Just the churches as a whole, each congregation as a whole. There were some churches that together they were they were a couple of them were were advancing well. Some had just a few people that were hadn't defiled their garments. Some people had tolerated 
other people that shouldn't have been tolerated. See, they were the church was immature. Church of Philadelphia was it was mature, more mature, so it wasn't rebuked, wasn't rebuffed. Now this is not a strange way of reasoning, as I've said. This way Jesus says the churches, it's how Paul assessed the churches. He'd write an epistle to the whole church. And there may have just been some individuals in there that needed a special action to be taken, but it, it was in the interest of the whole church. That's why he wrote the epistle to the churches instead of just to an individual. Each church is expected by Jesus to be a mature church or he'll cut off his association with it. Or as he said, I'll take away your candlestick. That's, that's what that means. Well, this, this is not a common perception, but I will tell you that this has to be declared with great power. We've got in Joplin 160 churches. And most of them you don't have any idea of what they teach or anything. In fact, I've been to a, more ministers meetings than I really want to admit that I've been to. But I've never learned at any of these meetings what a preacher preached with the single exception of Brother Gene. Am I right? You were the, you were the, the, the other people didn't tell you what they preached. Brother Boyce did. Brother Boyce, yes. But the other people, the, the big timers, we didn't have any idea they were preaching about Mickey Mouse or Jesus. We didn't have any, and their people don't, didn't, don't talk about what they preach. And they're not on any public media, we don't know what they preach. And they don't print anything, we don't know what they preach. So how can a church be mature like that? He is targeting a mature church. He expects it. Now he says, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Given, yeah. Before you move on from that point, I was considering a, a shadow that was given in the uh, Old Covenant of Nehemiah and the workers of yeah. the wall. And a couple of times Nehemiah referred to the people gathering themselves together as one. Man. As one, that's right. But the, what was seen that the people did was what reflected the unity of the people. Amen. That they built the wall because he had one specific group working on one specific section. But when it was completed, yeah. every section was fitted perfectly together. Joined, so yeah. So then it was one unit of work. So I was considering this with the ministry that we have different members of the body, different ministries, different aspects of Christ, yeah. measures that we're going to go into here, different measures. But it, it takes us back to that knowledge of Christ. When we all have this unity of the knowledge of Christ, we're going to be able to perfectly fit the labors that we've been given of the Lord with the rest of the body to make up this perfect man. Amen. Yeah, when they joined, they worked on a section of the wall, but it, it had to meet up with the name. It had to join, join up with the next section of the wall. If you've been building a wall and you're two feet off from, <laughs> that would be unacceptable. Which makes all the more remarkable to work, because some of these sections that they built were large sections, but they they all joined together, fitly joined, fitly joined together. Yes. That's a church, one church for every three hundred, over three hundred people. One church for every 300 people in Joplin. Yeah. That's something? That's a lot. Yes, it is a lot. It's a lot. In the end, <coughs> the whole church will be one not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Now, for that to happen, something's got to be happening down here now. <laughs> you can see. Something's got to be happening now for that to happen there. All the church is going to be blameless. That's what the scripture says. For it to be blameless there, something's got to happen down here. And what has to happen here is a unity of faith and a unity of the knowledge of the Son of God. And that two-pronged view of knowledge will knit the people together. 
You may not, you can't knit people together on the basis of marital status. Yeah. <laughs> what are you going to do with the widows and the single people? People preach on family values, they forget the widows and the single people. They're sitting out there. What do you got for us? Someone should say, have you got anything for us? See? Or those who just emphasize the youth, what about the aged? In the body of Christ, everyone's ministered to, so everyone can individually mature, so the whole body. Amen. We don't ask for a mature youth group, we ask for a mature church Amen. body. A mature church requires the purging of false doctrine. This is what was admonished some of the churches in the, the Revelation. There are some people who had, had to get, get rid of that teaching for the church to advance. They had to get rid of doctrines that pull people down. One church, Pergamum had a woman teaching that taught his God's servants to commit fornication and eat meat offered to idols. Others tolerated some people in their church accepted the doctrine of the Nicolaitans who were a, a lustful people. So, so they had to deal with that. See, for the church to mature, they had to get bad leaven out. Little leaven, leaven's the whole lump. The church of Corinth, if they ignored this word, come ye out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And if, it, if Corinth ignored that word, eventually they did Jesus wouldn't be holding them in his hand. Why? Because they couldn't advance on with that, with that influence there. They could not progress as they were supposed to. Every church has to determine what, if there is anything in the fellowship, any custom, any teaching, any people that is causing a retardation or is preventing people from growing up and whether it hurts anybody's feelings or not. Those influences have got to go or the people that have them have to repent. One of those two things have to happen or growth will not continue. If this isn't the case, the letters to the seven churches are pointless. And most of the epistles are pointless because that's why they were written. To get the situations that need to be corrected, corrected, and to get the people obtaining what is intended to be obtained because that's how the growth into a perfect man takes place. Paul knew the purpose of God for the churches and labored to this end. That was came on him every day, the care of all the churches. What do you suppose the care was? Well, the church, the attendance is way down. They, 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 don't, they, haven't, they don't have over 50 people there. What are we going to do? This is not the kind of care he had. It was this growing up into Christ in all things. That's the kind of care he had. It wasn't happening in all the churches, even in Paul's day. This deterioration started. Amen. Even then it started. Already some people were saying, teaching things that ought not to be taught. And effects were being made that shouldn't be made. Those who glory in the largest of an assembly, affirming how much more we can do because we're large, then they need to be bearing a lot of fruit. Hmm? You got to stop telling about what they can do. We can do a lot. We can do a lot more philanthropic work in the community. Well, I don't doubt that that may be the case. But that isn't what God sent us to do. We're not community reformers. You know, there was a, uh, a drought that hit the Judea area in the early, early in the first century. It wasn't just the Christians that were affected, was it? But they're the only ones they took an offering up for. It's just, it's just yeah. I'm not drawing any conclusions. It's just an interesting observation. It's just an interesting observation. They didn't say, no, let's uh, send a team down there to Jerusalem, Judea. He just said he could collect stuff for the poor saints at Jerusalem. That's what he said. That's what he said. And that was in order to keep this spiritual health so that people would not be distracted, unduly distracted by circumstance. Now we're not saying it's wrong to help people, understand. We're saying it's not right to neglect God's people. That's what we're saying. Yeah. We're measured by that standard. We have one corporation here in town that gave over a million dollars. There you are. To storm 
Here you are. Recovery and so forth. A yeah. corporation did that. Yes. God gained nothing from that. He didn't get the glory for that. Yes, people there's, didn't either. There's people that there's people that do that sort of thing. So it's, it's nickel and dime stuff when God's people are pulled off to that sort of emphasis. I want to underscore emphasis. They're nickel and dime in it. Where there are other people like this that that address those needs. <laughs> yeah. I think I'll conclude there. But you can see the uh, the importance of growing up into Christ and the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Yes, brother. I was uh, just seeing like the grace of God and all of that and that Jesus like prayed for this unity and then there were gifts given, given to bring this unity about. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's just comforting knowing that what God wills, He will also He will make a means for that oh, yes. to, for that to happen. Amen. 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 Yeah, he, he sent the apostles with a message and the Spirit with the power. Yes, and they all of the means required for this have been supplied. And the will of the Lord to be it will be done, as this brother as well said. The only question is whether you are involved in it. That's the only. It's not going to have any bearing on the outcome. If you're involved, it has no bearing on the outcome. So, so it's left it out of the hands of, uh, of the people, put in the hands of the Lord. All power has been given to him. Anyone else tonight? Yes, Brother Mike. Jesus prayed uh, that they all may be one. Yeah. And in another place, the Scripture says that the <clears throat> God is one. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, these three are one. God is, in the end, He's uh, going to incorporate His people yeah. into the Godhead. Yeah. As, as the habitation of God, as yeah. the bride of Christ. And God is not going to cease being one. Mm -hmm. And so this yeah. the way he's designed this is for pastors, apostles, prophets, pastors, and teachers to build the people up so that they fit in to what God has intended yeah. for the church. Yeah. Because God's God's not He's going to dispense himself in in his church, yet he's not going to lose anything. He's still there's still going to be unity, mm -hmm. and so we've got to come up to the the church has got to come to unity in order to to fit into what God has intended. Amen. A, another thought, um, I appreciate the way the graciousness of the Lord in um, <clears throat> so many things come in pairs or in groups <laughs> in the kingdom, mm -hmm. and this is. Uh, a great benefit for us because a lot of times you may not be able to see one aspect of something. Like you, you might uh, be wondering, do I have eternal life or not? I don't. I mean, I just don't feel it or something to that ex that extent. Or I, I'm just not sure. Well, then you can say, "What do I love the brethren?" Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I do. Well, there you go. Then you mm -hmm. then you have eternal life. Mm -hmm. And there's other things in that nature, but and these two things that are paired in here, the unity of the faith and the unity of the knowledge of the Son of God. This is another uh, good thing for us to know if you, if there at some time for one reason you can't see one of those, but you can detect the other, mm -hmm. then you know that you're you're on the right path Amen. and headed the right That's direction. Right. That's right. Manifest <laughs> tokens. Mm -hmm. Tokens, yeah. Amen. Yes, Brother Tony. I was uh, refreshed. We've talked about. We were talking about the apostles, and uh, although I had, I knew this, but it was re it was refreshing to see this again. Particularly if you come from where I did, where you're taught that when the apostles died, when the last apostle died, everything died with them. All the gifts died, and all. Mm -hmm. But you know, really, the apostles passed because men died. But their work, yeah, and, yes. and oh, yeah. actually, the apostles from a perspective, are very much still with us right, because, because of the the, uh, the epistles they wrote and yeah. the legacy they left behind. 
in the Word of God is still active and still alive. And so, you know, everything that uh, made up their ministry is still alive Lord, as well. Lord, so amen. None of that uh, is true that, you know, that we were taught. Our, for so amen. Mm -hmm. That's right. It's all still alive. It's just as much as... It's just as much as that word they preached is still alive. That's right. All those other things associated with it are still yeah. alive. And it kind of hit me fresh. Yeah, that's because they're alive. That's right. Amen. Amen. It's, it's all, they're eternal. That's they're right. right. Yeah, they're, I, they're not idle in the glory. They're not idle. Amen. That was the case, then let's quit preaching. Because it doesn't matter. If, if their work is not valid, if it's That's not right. still uh, true right. and alive and functional, then just forget it. we got no foundation That's there. right. Did you, Did you hear this, Brother Gene? Oh, sure. <laughs> yes, we know very well what you're okay. talking about. <laughs> they said it with a serious face, too. Yeah. It, just, it reduced the apostolic doctrine to just precepts and academics. Yeah. Now you understand there was a reason why they taught this way. They they were afraid someone might think they were Pentecostals if they didn't. Oh yeah, that's the truth. Yeah, that's the truth. In the meantime, there were some respects in which that other uh, group was way ahead of this group. <laughs> so it's just good to have you think in terms of unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, and you don't think in terms of these various names. Amen. See, these are attainments mm -hmm. that are common to the children of God. And when you see them, boy, you just rejoice. And There's gain. freedom right there. There's freedom, amen. And you notice that whenever you have fellowship with one of those brethren, that you have one of these points, then the rest of the things just sort of fall off the That's sides. right. Amen. You focus on what you can agree on about yeah. the Lord. Amen. <laughs> All right, we'll have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the nature of salvation, the effectiveness of it. We thank you for supplying all of the means necessary to be what you want us to be. And we look forward, Father, to being with you in glory and being stripped of all encumbrances and all handicaps. And in preparation for that, we aim now to put off whatever we can put off and put on what you've given us to put on. In Jesus' name we thank you. Amen.